very nice. Well, last week, we left chapter 2 with the pagan Babylonian King Nebuchadnezzar praising the Lord. Then he promoted the Hebrew captives, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, to a position of wealth and authority. The pagan king, upon hearing Daniel's proclamation of God, revealing to him his dream with its interpretation according to the scripture, caused the king to fall prostrate, prostrate before Daniel and say, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Sounds pretty good, like, like good praise and worship, doesn't it? If you saw somebody fall on their face here in the service this morning, you'd be, well, now they're worshiping the Lord, aren't they? Or Tina and our dear sister Kelly would be on top of them trying to make sure they're still alive, one of the two. <laughs> Daniel chapter 3 begins with this same king erecting an image to worship near the city of Babylon. This image was 90 feet high and 9 feet thick. It was covered in gold. It was in a place where thousands could gather. It was located where it could be seen for miles. Now, in the king's dream, chapter 2, that we just talked about, that Daniel had interpreted was a giant image as well. But in the dream, the image had a gold head which represented Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. And this was followed by a chest of silver that represented another kingdom that would overthrow Babylon. And then there were thighs of bronze, a kingdom that would defeat the Persians. And then there were legs of iron, which would crush the Greeks. And then brittle feet made of iron and clay. And in the king's dream, a mountain came and toppled all of them, which represented the kingdom of God. We might get the impression from what the king said at the end of chapter 2, he had become a believer in God. But we see from the description given here in verse 1 of chapter 3 that this king built a giant image only made of gold. Did you catch that? Which represented only himself and the nation of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar had witnessed a move of God. He had heard a revelation of God. Even spoke words of praise about God, but he had not become a follower of God. He simply added the Hebrew God to his long list of God's little g. And I think that canon still does happen with people, don't you? Some crisis comes along and people pray and then praise the Lord when rescue or relief happens. Some people witness something they confess must be a movement of God. People go to church when it's convenient and sing their songs and pray the prayers of praise, but their hearts are not changed. And they continue to be the God, little g, of their own lives. Here's a truth. From what I read in this book right here, that I think is holy, living, active, there's no halfway commitment to the Lord. There's no adding God to our already busy lives. There is only God as God and we as His children. Well, anyway, King Nebuchadnezzar, he erects this massive, massive image when he summons all the people to come and worship it. The word used in this passage for worship means to fall face down on your belly on the ground and give homage. 
The writer of this passage is very careful to let us know about the incredible crowd that was gathered from all the nations who had come under Babylonian domination. The passage is very careful to let us know that this was a festival and a big celebration. So people would have been dressed in their best. Then we're given extensive information about the musical instruments used. And for all the musicians in the house, I always find that interesting, all the instruments that they used and had. But the reason the writer here, chapter 3, gives us all this information is to draw our attention to the fact that King Nebuchadnezzar was proclaiming himself and Babylon as the image to be worshipped. He spoke an edict that when he gave the order or signal in the band played, everyone, everyone, every race, every color, every creed, every religion, and every nation was to fall on their face on the ground and worship this gold statue. In essence, worship Nebuchadnezzar and the nation of Babylon. This self-centered king has refused to allow God to be God in his life. And we see it. We see it in this passage. We see his character once again return to mistrustful, fear-filled violence in his life. And with this law to bow before this giant image, he adds a command that furnaces are to be prepared and anyone who does not worship the image is to be tossed into them and burned alive. Bow to the image or die. I mean, this, this, is, this is what this king, who just one chapter ago we heard praising God, But there is a kink in the king's arrogance. He learns from some of his advisors that certain Jews whom the king has promoted refuse to worship the image. In essence, they refuse to bow to him and the nation of Babylon. And here we notice that in the scripture, these accusers do not use their Hebrew names, but the names given by the Babylonians. Do you remember back in chapter 1, they took the Hebrew names and they said, that's not your names anymore. We're going to name you Belteshazzar and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and all four of those names honor one of the Babylonian gods. But they can give them names till the cows come home and it didn't change Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They knew who they were in the God, the Almighty. Despite all the pomp and circumstance and this big festival that was going on and despite the accusations which carried a death sentence, these three men remained faithful to give their worship only to God. Would you stand this morning for the reading of the word? I will be reading from Daniel chapter 3 beginning with verse 12. I'll be using the New King James Version this morning. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you're ready, at the time you hear the sound of the horn flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Just as in chapter 2, when anyone crosses Nebuchadnezzar, he goes into a rage. He calls the three men to be brought before him. He questions them as to the truth of the advisor's accusations about their disloyalty. You see, it was even deeper than just not worshiping some god. By not bowing to the image, this would have been considered an act of treason. Hence, the death sentence by fire. Obviously, these men are respected by the king because he gives them a second chance. Did you catch that? He gives them a second chance to recant and to bow to the image. And what amazes me is right here in this text... In a very calm manner, they tell him, we don't need a second chance. We don't need you to give us a second chance. They had already decided what they were and were not going to do. And I think for us, this is huge. You see, when a crisis comes into my life, when a temptation comes into my life, when something comes into my life, I better be prayed up and know exactly how to handle it. Or at least exactly how to put it in God's hands. Because if I wait until the crisis happens, if I wait until the temptation comes, before I start being close to God and being where I need to be with God, guess what's going to happen? I'm probably going to bow to whatever it is. These guys had already made up their mind. They will only worship God. They honor the Lord by proclaiming that He is able to deliver them if He chooses. But even if He lets them burn to a crispy critter, they will only worship Him. These men are faithful to God. They're faithful to only worship God. They refuse to be swayed this way or that. They don't worry about whether they will be rescued or not. They commit themselves to only worship God. God above all, God first. Only God. Because they understood that only God is worthy of worship. You know, everything that vies for our homage is not worthy of worship. Just like everything good is not necessarily of God. We've got to be careful. We've got to be like the three Hebrew children here. We've got to be ready. <coughs> long before we get brought before the king. The Lord has been so good to us, he's brought people and events into our lives, good and bad, that have turned our eyes to him. And all of these experiences give us the opportunity to make God the ruler of our life. Faith is not just knowing about God. It is not just seeing God do a miracle. King Nebuchadnezzar proves that. He heard about God. He knew about God. He witnessed an act of God. And he even bowed at one point and said, God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings. Yet his heart was not changed. He was not a wholehearted disciple. This might be a good time to assess our commitment to Jesus. We must guard against knowing all about him but not knowing him. And this moment might be a good time to ask, is God who I worship or am I bowing to some other image? 
And idols don't have to be 90 feet tall and they don't have to be made of gold. Idols are anything that capture our adoration, love, and commitment from God and give it to something else. I bet we never see a 90 foot gold statue out in the field. But we might get captured by something else. Let's just take a moment. This is in the end of the service. But I, th I think we need to take a moment and just everybody talk to the Lord and just ask the question, have I allowed anything to take your place? And if we find we have put something before God, let us confess it, repent of it, and be restored because that's what God does. Upon hearing the refusal by the Hebrews, the king orders the furnaces heated seven times harder than normal. They're blasting. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are tied up, fancy clothes and all. And some really beefed up soldiers grab them up and throw them in. The heat is so intense, it kills the soldiers at the door. Within a flash, the king jumps to his feet and shouts, Look, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they're not hurt. And the fourth is the form like the Son of God. When God is God of our lives, when He who is worthy of worship and honor gets it, we can rest assured no matter what flames we get tossed into, He is with us. He's with us whether we live or die. He is with us whether the circumstances change or not. He is with us whether we feel better or not. He is with us no matter what. In the flames, God walks with His children. And we are His children, sons and daughters of the living God. Worship to God alone is our purpose and call. Everything else, everything else that comes with a God-centered life comes out of worship. And, and worship is not just music and worship is not just uh, what methods we use. Worship is adoring God above everything else. Loving God above everything else. Verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire. And the satraps, administrators, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together, and they saw these men on whose body the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god, capital G. Brothers and sisters, may that be said of us everywhere we go. Let's pray. Well, Father, we desire to worship you as you deserve. 
Help us, Lord, to grow into the sort of worshipers that you're seeking, faithful and true like these three Hebrew men. We pray that our lives may be lives that honor you in all circumstances, even in the midst of the fire. Lord, we, we humbly ask that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would help us to make you our first priority. Help us to recognize images or idols or anything that vie for our attention, our time, our money, our abilities, whatever. May we honor you above everything else. Help us serve you with all our being. Help us love you as you've loved us. Enable us to be people who only bow our hearts to you and you alone. Brothers and sisters, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you at this